all I've ever wanted is a girl who will love me as deeply and enthusiastically as I love her. Why does it feel like I'll never find that? This wasn't a conscious thought that Carter Sahayek had had in his teenage years, but looking back as an adult, he saw how it had been a persistent longing that colored much of his youth. He remembered moments of pure desperation where his yearning to feel loved by a partner would sit like an infinite void in the pit of his stomach and would only briefly fade when he felt a glimmer of affection from someone he was attracted to. But it was only ever a fleeting feeling of love, not like how he felt now. Carter's family had moved to America from India when he was a child, and even before he started living a more conscious life, he'd always known that he didn't want a relationship like his parents had. They were in an arranged marriage, and to Carter, they seemed more like reluctant business partners than a happy couple. Any affection he saw between them was usually forced to give the appearance of being a happy couple to company. Perhaps that's why he fell so in love with romance stories. He would watch action movies and comedies as well, but would always be most drawn to the romances intertwined within those stories. At least, when they were done well. He also had a passion for competition. He'd compete at anything, always having an unusual natural joy from going up against people better than himself, as he saw that every loss taught him something. He'd even have his eyes on fighting in the Global Vigilance League someday. His uncle had been in India's top 10 fighters for years with an ancestral power that Carter could use as well, through a set of family heirlooms called the Shakti Ke Card, or Cards of Power. Everyone in his family had the unique ability to access many different superhuman powers, but they were very difficult to control without some sort of activation. Because of this, one of Carter's great ancestors had made a deck of 111 cards, and each one, when stuck to a part of a Sahayak's body, would awaken a correlating ability. Without training, using a single one of these cards could be very draining to the body, but Carter's uncle had gotten good enough that he could use three different abilities at once, consistently through his fights. Sadly though, none of the cards could cure a terminal illness. His uncle passed away, and the cards were divided between Carter and two of his cousins. With 36 of his own, he did train with them a fair amount, but also spent much more of his time and energy in his youth looking for love. In middle school, Carter would ask girls to every dance coming up. He'd get far more no's than yeses, despite being a fairly attractive young man, but even when he did get a yes, none of these dates would ever turn into a relationship. That is, until high school. When Carter crushed on a girl, he crushed hard. He'd also make big romantic gestures to those he wanted to ask out, like giving giant bouquets of flowers to girls in the lunchroom, or sneaking into the office to sing confessions of his love over the PA system. He also started working out, because he'd realized that girls were more into fit guys, which thankfully meant he also trained more with his cards of power. He figured the best way to get exercise and have fun doing it was to join the high school vigilance league, which kept him training, even though he was mainly doing it to look good for girls. Even still, he was confused to see that he was frequently given outright rejections to his affections, or given the infinitely worse, oh yeah, maybe we could go out sometime, which inevitably led to a few weeks of hope turning into confusion, then the eventual realization that the answer all along had actually been a no in disguise. The frequent rejections hurt, and Carter didn't understand what he was doing wrong, but still, he remained undeterred. In his early life, he was a naturally optimistic person who knew that he could get rejected over and over again, but all it would take is eventually getting the right person to say yes. And in the 11th grade, he thought he'd finally found that one. Her name was Marika Cho. She came to Carter's school at his same age, but was a year above him because she'd skipped a grade. She was also on track to get a full university scholarship for her youth vigilance record. She had the unique pairing of being able to transform into a humanoid fish creature with a tail and durable scales that made it difficult to harm her, along with teleportation. She trained consistently to hone the use of these abilities in tandem to produce a very uncommon fighting style. Of course, she joined the high school's vigilance team, and that made Carter even more excited to go to practice. He developed a crush on her instantly, despite knowing very little about her. 
and for the first time, someone showed true, genuine appreciation for his affections. Marika hadn't been nearly as driven to find love as Carter, but was enamored with him quickly for his open honesty of his feelings for her. She told Carter she was very focused on her budding vigilance career, but that she would love to go out with him. They had a passionate start to their relationship, and Carter showered her with compliments and gifts. One of their favorite things to do together was to go to a park near their homes, do a bit of training in the outdoor gym there, then curl up under a large oak tree, resting against each other. They'd also always say hi to the old man in large robes that seemed permanently placed on the same park bench, with a soft grin on his face. They'd say hi to him, and he'd nod happily to them. Then as they sat against the tree, they'd make up stories about him being a secret spy or a billionaire investor who didn't need to work now and just spent his life sitting in the park while more money rolled into his bank accounts. It was a funny little game, but in truth, Carter didn't care what they were doing as long as they were together. Mostly, though, Carter and Marika would spend a lot of their time training, and it was a win-win because Carter loved spending time with her and loved competing with someone who was clearly better than him. Carter's skills were not to be dismissed, but Marika was much more focused on the training than he was. Marika also did extra training sessions outside of school, but would still make an effort to spend time with Carter. At least, for the first few months. Slowly, Carter started to feel like Marika was paying less and less attention to him. When they were together, she acted pretty similar to how she had before, but she was cancelling their plans more and more often, and saying fewer affectionate things to him. He tried to ignore this and just went on being his usual loving self. Eventually, though, she got her acceptance to the prestigious Unitalia University, which meant she'd be moving to the island country of Unitalia. Carter was desperate for her to ask him to go with her. He hadn't been accepted to the program himself, but he didn't care. As long as he was with her, he'd move there and get a job doing whatever. But she wasn't asking him to go. Carter instinctively started acting more and more affectionate, giving her more gifts and sending tons of complimentary texts out of the blue when they weren't together. He'd occasionally get some affection back, and that would hold him over for a few hours, but eventually a sense of fear and dread would sink back in. He knew something must be wrong, but was too scared to ask what, and eventually just started getting angry that she wasn't being as loving towards him as he wanted. When he was alone, he'd vent to himself about how he was so kind and giving and deserved more from her, but then when they were in person, he wouldn't say anything about it. It would be too easy to ignore as he'd just soak in the time with her. Eventually, though, he found that his usual optimistic demeanor had faded, and he'd wake up every day feeling more drained of energy than when he'd gone to sleep. He started going on frequent walks while alone to try and clear his head and not think about Marika's lessening affections to him. One day in particular, he'd be out with a substantial scowl on his face, going through the park that he often went to with Marika. He passed by the old man in the robes, but didn't even take notice. Until he was on the way home and passed again. Just as he stepped by, a voice said, Would you like to talk about it? He stopped and looked back at the man who was softly smiling, looking at him curiously. Carter looked him up and down and asked, are, are you a mind reader or something? The man replied, One does not need to be a mind reader to see that yours is diseased. Carter paused for a moment, alarmed by the fact that this man could even speak as he'd never heard it before, but something in him compelled him to sit and unload all his concerns he was having to this total stranger. The man seemed to be very compassionately and intently listening to everything Carter said, and it felt amazing to just spill out everything he'd experienced and was thinking. He ended with where things were now. He was being more affectionate than ever, and Mariko was still acting distant. When Carter finally finished, the man nodded and slowly said, It seems as though you are a very kind and loving young man who genuinely wants what's best for yourself and the young lady. Hearing that made Carter feel good, but only until the man continued. With that said, you should no longer try to manipulate her into doing what you want. Carter furiously stood up and exclaimed, I'm not trying to manipulate her, I would never do that. But the man chuckled quietly and said, Did you not say that you've started being more affectionate to her in the hopes that she would start doing the same back? 
Carter replied, That's not being manipulative, I'm just showing her how much I care about her, and I deserve to get some love back for that, don't I? The man then said, Giving love with the intent to receive something in return is not truly giving love. Carter was in a huff and wanted to retaliate, but a part of him knew what the man was saying was true. He then continued, Luckily for you, I have a solution to quickly rid yourself of all your relationship woes. Ask her what's up. Carter left soon after that, feeling terrified, but at least thinking about why he felt that way more deeply for once. He was scared of coming across as needy if he asked her why she wasn't being more affectionate, and was more scared still of learning that maybe Marika didn't want him to come to Unitalia with her. Despite his fears, he got Marika to meet up with him, and he finally asked her why she was being more distant. She told him almost exactly what he'd feared. She said she'd loved how warm and kind he was to her, but that as they'd gotten closer to her graduating, she'd started to think she wanted to spend the next few years focusing on her career exclusively. She said that Carter was an incredible boyfriend, but she didn't think their relationship was what she needed at this point in her life. She'd wanted to make things work because he was so kind, but now she was starting to think it wasn't going to happen. Marika told him that as much as it hurt her to say it, their relationship had to end. Carter went home and wept, thinking he'd just lost his one shot at the relationship he'd always wanted. They'd had similar interests, she'd appreciated his affections, at least in the beginning, and she'd been so loving and warm at the start, and now he was back to ground zero with nobody, no love in his life. Then, his sadness started to turn into anger. He marched back out to the park to find the old robed man once again and said, She dumped me! You didn't get rid of my relationship woes, you made everything worse! The old man still just softly smiled. Is this worse? Your choice was either continue on in a relationship that made you feel deeply unfulfilled and confused, or learn the truth of why she'd grown distant and set yourself and her free. The condensed pain you feel from this rejection will pale in comparison to the pain of remaining in a relationship where you feel scared and confused, will it not? The man saying that cut through Carter's anger. He was right again. And worse still, it made Carter realize that if he hadn't talked to Marika, and it had just gone on with her only kind of feeling it, they could have both ended up stuck in an unhappy relationship, just like Carter's parents, the exact thing he'd been trying to avoid. Carter sat down, his anger having shifted back to sadness, and now more open to what the man had to say. Carter asked, So, what do I do now? He replied, Stop seeking love outside of yourself. Become love, embody it through the things that bring you joy. What is it you love to do that does not involve seeking a romantic partner? Carter had invested so much of his life in finding and keeping a relationship that everything else felt distant. But he said he liked vigilance tournaments, and he really enjoyed competing with people better than himself. But his favorite person to train with had been Marika, and now that didn't really feel like an option. The old man stood up with his robes billowing down from his shoulders as he said, Well... For now, I suppose you can train with me. Carter kinda chuckled and said, No offense, but I don't want to hurt you, sir. Then the man whipped off his robes and revealed an absolutely shredded physique. Across his back was tattooed a giant fierce bear sitting and making an E-shape with its body. Carter recognized this tattoo instantly. The man he'd been speaking with had once been an American vigilance legend named Eggard Swole who one day had vanished from the league scene. Despite a short frame, he had S-tier super strength and the power to summon the glowing image of a bear around his body to intimidate his opponents and put on quite a show. He told Carter that he had given up most of his vigilance lifestyle when he realized that it wasn't bringing him true happiness, but then he found that through meditation and contemplating the prior emotional waves of his life, while also learning to be more fully in the present, the peace he'd long wanted was found. He also said that he trained in that park between 2am and 4am to let out his pent-up physical energy. The boy had just never come around at the right time to see it. After that, Carter started training with Eggard physically, while also soaking in all the life lessons the incredibly wise man had to teach. 
Carter started to learn from introspection, encouraged by his new teacher, that all the time he'd been seeking love, he'd actually been seeking someone to satisfy his need for affection, and that underlying desperation had kept him from finding a genuine partner, someone he could learn and grow with without needing the other person to complete him. Carter trained with the man through the end of high school. He even encouraged Eggard to write some books with his experiences and life lessons. Carter took on the job of publishing the books, and together they garnered a fair amount of success, with many people then hiring Eggard through Carter for speaking engagements. Carter became Swole's assistant, and it turned into a very lucrative career. All the while, Carter continued his training and started fighting in some lower vigilance tournaments, though he was struggling to break into the American League. Carter even watched from a distance as Mariko went on to win the Unitalia Invitational, a fairly prestigious tournament, and he'd feel nothing but happiness for her. He spent more than a decade working with Eggard, and in that time, he still liked the idea of finding a relationship, but no longer felt the need to pursue it to fulfill him. His life had become full without it, so when he did eventually find one, it would just be another beautiful addition to an already full life. Eventually, though, a new call would come to him, something that resonated deeply in his soul. He heard an interview on TV in which a nationally ranked American fighter named Freya Sparks had angrily said, I'll be happy when I'm the global vigilance champion. The words had echoed in Carter's mind, as if it was himself as a kid feeling like he'd only feel fulfilled once he had a girlfriend. He heard that same line said by Freya in Vigilance News over and over again, and after Sparks won the Global League Champions, he saw later interviews with her and could tell that she still wasn't happy. On a complete whim, Carter told Eggard that he needed to take some time off and move to Freya's home city. It felt reckless and more than a bit creepy, but something in him said that he needed to be for her what Eggard had been for him. A mentor that helps you see that love and happiness are not something that you can find outside yourself, but something you have to develop from within. I hope you enjoyed the second episode of Vigilance, and if you haven't seen it yet, there's a full episode on Freya Sparks where Carter shows up to start helping her. That'll be linked on the screen here along with an episode on a guy named Augie Knight, who's from the very unique and monster-filled island of Unitalia, which got briefly mentioned in this story. If you enjoyed this, I bet you'll enjoy those episodes too.